Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Elliot and in this video we're going to talk about a classic physics challenge problem. It's the standard setup of a block sliding down a ramp, but this time the ramp is made of ice so that it's free to slide as well. I think just about every intro physics student learns to analyze a block on a ramp. But when the ramp is free to slide, it becomes a much tougher problem because as the block slides down, the ramp is getting pushed out and accelerates in the opposite direction. The question is, if we release the block from the top of the ramp, how long is it going to take until it hits the ground? This is going to be a tough problem, so I encourage you to grab a piece of paper and follow right along with me. And I've also written up notes that cover all of this. You can get those for free at my website, and I'll put that link down in the description. So the setup is going to be that we have a ramp that's inclined up at an angle theta, and we set a block on top of it. The ramp is totally frictionless, meaning that both the block on the top surface slides without friction, and also the bottom of the ramp slides on whatever table that it's sitting on. Say that the block has mass little m, the ramp has mass big M, and say it has length L. We want to know how long it'll take for the block to slide all the way down to the ground if we release it from rest from the top of the ramp. As a warm-up, let's actually quickly review the case where the ramp is nailed down and doesn't slide. I made another video all about that problem, which I'll link up in the corner, so you should watch that and then come back to this one if you need more of a refresher. We start with the free body diagram. There's only two forces acting on the block, gravity mg that's pulling down, and the normal force n from the ramp that's pointing perpendicular to the surface. Now we add up those forces and write f equals ma. That's a vector equation, but the block is only moving in one direction, along the length of the ramp. So let's define a coordinate q that measures the position of the block with respect to the top of the ramp. The only force that's pointing in the q direction is the component of gravity that points parallel to the ramp. With a little bit of geometry, you can see that force is mg times the sine of theta. Then the f equals ma equation for q is mg sine of theta equals m times q double dot, where q double dot stands for the acceleration of q. In other words, it's the second derivative of q with respect to time. This is a nice and simple equation. It just says that the block slides down the ramp with constant acceleration. Q double dot equals g times sine of theta. Then since the block started at rest at q equals zero when t was equal to zero, the trajectory is just one half times the acceleration times t squared. And if we want to know how long it'll take for the block to hit the ground, we just set q equal to the length l of the ramp and then solve for the time t. It's 2 times l divided by the acceleration g sine theta, and then we take the square root. Let's do some checks to see if this actually makes sense. First of all, what if theta is equal to 0? In that case, our ramp is actually just a flat table, and so our block should just be sitting at rest. And indeed, when we plug in theta equals 0, we get q double dot equals g times the sine of zero, which indeed vanishes. How about when theta equals pi over two? In that case, the ramp becomes a vertical wall and our block should be in free fall. Well, we get q double dot equals g times the sine of pi over two, which indeed is just equal to g. All right, that was our warm up. Now we want to understand what will happen if the ramp itself is free to slide. By Newton's third law, whatever normal force n the ramp was exerting on the block, the opposite force is going to be acting on the ramp itself. That means that as the block slides down to the right, the ramp is going to get pushed out to the left. I'm going to explain how to solve this problem using f equals ma. It's the most straightforward approach, although it's not necessarily the most efficient. There are faster ways of answering this question. And in the notes, I describe two other approaches, one using energy conservation and the other using the Lagrangian method. So if you're curious, I encourage you to go check those out after you've watched the video. Again, I'll put that link down in the description. So we'll start again here with the free body diagrams, this time for the ramp and for the block. The block is as before. We've got gravity, little mg, pulling down, 
and the normal force N pointing perpendicular to the surface of the ramp. As for the ramp itself, we again have gravity, big MG, pulling down. Then there's the opposite normal force of the block pushing on the ramp. And finally, there's another normal force from the ground pushing on the ramp. So there we go. Those are the free body diagrams for the ramp and for the block. Now we want to write down the F equals MA equations for each one. Since both the ramp and the block are going to be moving now, we're going to need to set up some more coordinates. I'm going to set the origin off to the left somewhere at the height of the top of the ramp. Then I'll let big X denote the position of the top corner of the ramp. And I'll let little x and little y be the coordinates of the block. So now let's write down the F equals MA equations. I'm going to break things up into the horizontal and vertical components this time. So acting on the block, the normal force breaks up into n sine theta to the right and n cosine theta pointing up. Then the horizontal F equals MA equation is n sine theta equals m times little x double dot. And in the vertical direction, n cosine theta minus little mg equals m times y double dot. Now we'll do the same for the ramp. The normal force just gets reversed here. So the horizontal equation is minus n sine of theta equals big M times big X double dot. And in the vertical direction, we've got the normal force from the ground going up minus the weight big MG going down minus n cosine of theta equals zero. It's equal to zero here because the ramp is stuck on the surface of the ground. We don't actually care too much about this last equation. All it's going to do is tell us that the normal force from the ground is whatever it has got to be to keep the ramp from falling through the ground. It's the other three equations which are more interesting here. Note right off the bat that the two horizontal equations have equal and opposite forces on the left-hand side. So if I add them together, those forces will cancel out, and we'll be left with big M times big X double dot plus little m times little x double dot equals zero. So what's going on here? Well, think about the block plus ramp system. Newton's law for the system says that the total force equals the rate of change of the momentum. But in this case, there is no net horizontal force. That normal force is an internal force, meaning it's a force between two pieces of the system, the block and the ramp in this case. Therefore, the total horizontal momentum is constant. And that's what this equation says if we integrate it once. We get big M times big X dot plus little m times little x dot equals zero because everything started at rest at t equals zero. So that's just the statement of conservation of momentum in the horizontal direction. And again, it follows because there's no net horizontal force on the block plus ramp system. Another way of saying the same thing is that the horizontal coordinate for the center of mass of the system has got to be fixed. So as the block slides to the right, the ramp has got to move to the left so that the center of mass stays at the same horizontal position. All right, now let's go back and simplify our equations a bit. First of all, we don't really care about this normal force n, so let's try to eliminate it. We can take our vertical equation for the block and multiply it by sine of theta. Then we get n sine of theta times cosine of theta minus little mg sine theta equals little m y double dot sine of theta. Now, if I use the horizontal equation that told us n sine of theta equals little m little x double dot, I can plug that in here to get rid of n altogether. So if we simplify this equation a bit, first of all, we can cross out all those little m's and then rewrite it as cosine of theta times little x double dot minus sine of theta times little y double dot equals g sine of theta. And also don't forget about our other equation for the center of mass coordinate. That said big x double dot equals minus little m divided by big m times little x double dot. All right, so at this stage, we've simplified our equations of motion and gotten rid of the normal force that we didn't care about. But we have a problem here, because we have two equations, but three unknowns. In other words, we don't know little x double dot, little y double dot, 
or big X double dot. So we're going to need a third equation if we're going to figure all these things out. And the thing we haven't taken into account yet is the fact that the block is constrained to move along the surface of the ramp. But we can take care of that by going back to our coordinate Q that measured the position of the block measured from the top of the ramp. We just need to figure out how Q is related to our new coordinates X and Y. And we can do that just by drawing a little right triangle here. We've got Q on the hypotenuse, and then little x minus big X in the horizontal direction, and minus y in the vertical direction, minus because this leg is pointing down. So with our little triangle, we can figure out how Q is related to x and y. We've got cosine of theta is equal to little x minus big X divided by the hypotenuse Q. And likewise, the sine of theta is equal to minus y on the opposite side divided by Q on the hypotenuse. Then if we solve these equations for little x and little y, we find that little x equals q times the cosine of theta plus big X, and y equals minus q times the sine of theta. Now we can plug those into our f equals ma equations in order to write everything in terms of q. So we've got cosine of theta times q double dot cosine theta plus big X double dot, then minus sine of theta times y double dot, but that gives us plus sine squared times q double dot. All that equals g times sine of theta. Now we can do some simplifying here. Notice when I multiply this cosine of theta factor through, I'm going to get cosine squared of theta times q double dot. But then I'm also adding sine squared of theta times q double dot. And since cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1, those are just going to give me a single term of q double dot. So we get q double dot plus cosine of theta times big X double dot equals g sine of theta. And now let's also simplify our equation for big X double dot. We've got big X double dot equals minus little m over big M times q double dot cosine of theta plus big X double dot. And that gives us an equation that we can solve for big X double dot in terms of Q. We can write it as big M times big X double dot equals minus little m cosine of theta times Q double dot minus little m big X double dot. And now if I move that big X double dot on the right over to the left, I'm going to have big M plus little m on the left, and I can divide that out to get big X double dot equals minus little m divided by big M plus little m times cosine of theta times q double dot. Now, I promise that we are almost done. After all this algebra, we've gotten things down to two equations, one for q double dot and one for x double dot, and now we're able to solve. All we need to do is take our second equation for big X double dot and plug it into the first equation, and then we'll be able to eliminate X altogether and just solve for the acceleration of the block. All right, so let's bring things home now. We're down to two equations and we just need to solve for Q double dot. So we're gonna plug big X double dot from the second equation into the first equation. That gives us Q double dot minus little m over big M plus little m cosine squared of theta times Q double dot equals G times sine of theta. Now let me simplify the left-hand side. We can pull out that common factor of Q double dot, and then we're left with one minus little m over big M plus little m times cosine squared theta. And I can put that fraction together because I'm gonna get big M plus little m minus little m cosine squared, all divided by big M plus little m. But notice here that this little m minus little m cosine squared is just little m times sine squared. And so at the end of the day, we can simplify the left-hand side to q double dot times big M plus little m sine squared of theta divided by big M plus little m. And now we're home free. We just flip over that fraction in order to solve for the acceleration q double dot. And we get g sine theta times big M plus little m divided by big M plus little m sine squared of theta. 
and that, at long last, is the acceleration of the block with respect to the ramp. Now once again, it's a good idea to do some checks to see if this answer makes any sense. First of all, can we see if it reproduces our earlier result when the ramp was nailed down to the ground? Well, we can reproduce that case by looking at the limit where the mass of the ramp is really, really heavy. In that limit, both the numerator and denominator here look like big M plus some relatively tiny number that we could ignore. So that gives us big M divided by big M, which is equal to one. So in this limit, we do reproduce our earlier result, which said that the acceleration was just G times the sine of theta. So that's a good sign. Our new, more general answer is consistent with what we had already solved for in a simpler version of the problem. And just like we did before, we can also look at some important special cases, like when theta equals zero or pi over two. If theta equals zero so that the ramp is flat, we again get q double dot equals zero, because that sine of zero is going to equal zero. When theta equals pi over two, now the ramp is a vertical wall again, and we're hoping to find that q double dot equals g. And indeed we do, because sine of pi over two equals one, and so this ratio of masses on the right side goes to one, and we just wind up with q double dot equals g. Finally, to answer our original question, which was how long it takes for the block to reach the ground, we just write down the trajectory. Q equals one half times this constant acceleration times t squared. And then we set that equal to the length L of the ramp. And finally, solve for the time t. It's two L divided by the acceleration, Q double dot. And finally, we take the square root. Now, there's nothing wrong with that solution. It was totally systematic. We drew the free body diagrams, we wrote down the equations of motion and applied the constraints, and then we solved for the acceleration. But strictly speaking, it was more work than we needed to do. And the reason is that we had to introduce the normal force n between the block and the ramp. But we didn't actually care about the normal force at all. We just wanted to know the acceleration of the block down the ramp. So you might ask yourself, is there a faster way of solving this problem that doesn't require talking about the normal force at all. And in fact, there are faster approaches, both for this problem and for many similar problems. In the notes that I wrote up to go along with the video, I described two other approaches, one that uses energy conservation and another that uses the Lagrangian method. So if you're curious about learning about those strategies, I encourage you to go look at those notes. Again, you can see them for free at the link that I'll put down in the description. All right, that's it for this video. I hope you found it helpful. Please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and also leave me a comment to let me know if there are any other classic physics problems that you might like me to cover in the future. Thanks for watching, everybody.